Now let's discuss demographic factors. What are demographic factors? Demographic factors are what determine if a population is growing or if a population is declining. And there's uh, a few that we have to discuss and you have to be familiar with for this course. So the first one is total fertility rate. And you've probably heard of this before. It's the average number of children born to a female. On an FRQ, you could say average number of people, average number of babies, that sort of thing, born to each in, uh, female individual within the country. I think it's between ages 15 to 45. So a TFR, a total fertility rate of 2.1 means that the average number of children that a female has within a country is 2.1 children. It's an average, so it's not going to be exactly a single whole number. Now, 2.1 is the replacement rate. It's the perfect TFR to replace the current population. The replacement rate is not 2. It's not 0. You need a 2.1, a little bit above 2 people, because yes, it takes 2 to tango, but you also have other factors causing people to die, um, so you want it to be a little bit higher. Particularly, emigration is one. Now, anything below 2.1 is population decline because you're below the replacement rate. You cannot replace the current population. And anything above 2.1 is population growth. You can re replace the current population and then some. The global total fertility rate is 2.4. Therefore, the globe is seeing population growth. So these are some examples here. You don't need to memorize these. You don't need to memorize the TFR of any country. But to provide some reference points, Japan's TFR is below 2.1. It's 1.3. So Japan is experiencing population decline. Egypt's TFR is 2.92, Nigeria 5.24. So Egypt and Nigeria are experiencing population growth. Nigeria is just seeing greater growth rates than Egypt. Infant mortality rate. This is the number of infants that die per 100,000 births. That's our, um, our reference point for our measurement. So infant mortality rate. Typically, as time goes on and as countries develop, this measurement decreases. So infant mortality rate in developed countries is smaller than in undeveloped countries. And they decrease because of increased access to sanitation, water, food, health care of really any kind, especially reproductive health care, because that allows uh, people to give birth to babies and they live uh, at higher rates. We also see education and reproduction and economic development being a big factor as well. So look here, Niger, which is right next to Nigeria, has an infant mortality rate of 38.12. That's a pretty high infant mortality rate. So they're not a very developed country. Uh, Mexico has an uh, infant mortality rate of 12.2, so it's kind of moderate. Their infant mortality rate is decreasing, but it's not as low as other countries. I wouldn't say it's a low infant mortality rate. Australia, though, has a low infant mortality rate. It is 2.6.76. So we can say that they are a pretty developed country. They have a strong economy. Um, they have access to family planning, they have reproductive healthcare systems in place, they have good sanitation, good water access, food, uh, that sort of thing. We also have maternal mortality rate. So uh, just like infants, this is per 100,000 births, and it's just the number of mothers that die due to pregnancy or delivery or just uh, child-related causes. So typically, infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rates are going to decrease simultaneously for the same reasons, for sanitation, health care improvements, particularly education, that sort of thing. So as a country, develop, right, the country develops, the IMR and the MMR are going to decrease because the standard of living and healthcare are going to so look at this. South Sudan has a maternal mortality rate of 1,223. That's a excruciatingly high maternal mortality rate. Haiti also has a very high mater maternal mortality rate, which is about 350. Colombia has 75, so it's kind of moderate. It's decreasing because uh, their country is developing to an extent. And then the Netherlands, which is a very developed country, has a maternal mortality rate of four. Um, it, it should be zero, but you know, four is really good, really good. Uh, they're probably very happy to be there, and they're going to continue to improvement. Uh, improve it. Yay. So there's some other terms that you need to know. Emigration means leaving a country, and immigration means entering a country. Do not get these two confused. Emigration. E means exit. Okay? E means exit. Leaving a country. Okay? Immigration, the one you probably are very familiar with, that means entering a country. I'm going to immigrate from the, uh, I'm going to immigrate to um, South Korea, and I'm going to emigrate, leave North Korea. Boom. So let's look at these to a little more in-depth, total fertility rates. So countries that have a high total fertility rate, so women are on average are going to give birth to more children. This doesn't say that they're going to die. It doesn't consider death rates. Um, they're going to have a higher population growth. So typically, you have a higher infant mortality rate since they're less developed. And these two kind of go, go, go hand in hand. If there's a higher infant mortality rate, women, uh, mothers, are going to have more children to ensure the survival of more of their offspring. 
So which country using the population pyramids, I told you, they're important. Which country has a total fertility rate closest to the replacement rate? So the population isn't really increasing that much, but the population isn't really decreasing that much. Okay, so we can see here that the Congo, they have exponential population growth. So they have a very high total fertility rate. They probably have a very high infant mortality rate. All right, let's look at Greece, all right? So the population, it had a kind of a pocket of linear growth here. Then it went kind of stable, and then now it's decreasing. So they have probably a very low uh, total fertility rate, and it's probably below replacement rate because they are decreasing. The United Kingdom, they've had some fluctuations, but relatively recently, it's been pretty stable. It's not increasing too much. It's not really decreasing too much. So they're not really seeing a lot of population growth, but they're not seeing a lot of population decline. So they're probably closer to that replacement rate of the total fertility rate, which is 2.1. So this is a map at a global scale showing the total fertility rate, looking at a national scale of analysis here. And we can obviously see that countries that are less developed, as particularly in sub-Saharan Africa um, and parts of Asia, um, are going to have a higher total fertility rate. But more developed countries like in Europe and Eastern Asia and um, parts of uh, North America, we're going to see a lower total fertility rate because they are more developed. What about the infant mortality rate? Um, which... So with the animation, yeah. So a high infant mortality rate has a high total fertility rate for the most part because families will have more children to compensate for the high likelihood that some of their children are just not going to survive to adulthood. It's kind of like an insurance. Um, and culture also has a big impact of total fertility rate too. So in a lot of cultures where having a lot of children is a sign of prosperity or in uh, countries where religion's a big factor and you're not allowed to have access to family planning, contraceptives, um, abortions, that sort of thing, those things will limit uh, birth rates. So they're going to have, they're going to be countries with a higher um, total fertility rate. So in countries with a high infant mortality rate, obviously we're going to see um, worse health care, but we also could see high poverty. People can't maybe afford certain health facilities. Larger families are often seen as a means of ensuring economic security or supporting the family's livelihood, which is often agriculture. So um, children, particularly male children, can be seen as a form of labor, especially on a farm, uh, to ensure the family uh, has a livelihood, they have food on the table, that sort of thing. So which country out of these three population pyramids has the lowest infant mortality rate? So we're looking at the country that is the most developed. Is it Yemen, which has a very uh, significant population growth rate? Is it Latvia, which is kind of declining in population? Or is it the Bahamas, which is increasing and decreasing? It's overall increasing, though. It's going to be Latvia, because they uh, we can see here that they have the lowest crude birth rates, which means that they're probably the most developed. I mean, look at their life expectancy. It's pretty big as well. So they probably have the lowest infant mortality rates. A lot of you may have been tempted to say Yemen, because they have a lot of youth, a lot of children. So obviously, they have a lot of children. They have a lower infant mortality rate. But look back at what we said here. Um... Larger families are seen as ensuring economic security or supporting the family's livelihood, and they may have more children to compensate for the high likelihood that they won't survive to adulthood. Um, we could see here, obviously, that not all the children in Yemen are surviving to adulthood. So we can see this uh, compensation being prevalent within the country. But, all right, so this is a map of the world, a global scale, at a national scale of analysis of the infant mortality rates of the world. So obviously, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of South Asia uh, have uh, higher infant mortality rates. None of them are at like 20 to 30. They're not that high anymore, but they are still pretty prevalent. And in countries that have better health care, better sanitation, food access, water access, um, that sort of thing, see a lower infant mortality rate. And if you can, if I put up the map of the total fertility rate, you would see similarities. Countries with higher infant mortality rates, for the most part, have higher total fertility rates. Now let's look at these two graphs here. Both of these graphs show the infant mortality rates in Nigeria. This is the top one, Nigeria. And then the bottom one shows the United Kingdom's infant mortality rates. So we can see here by looking at both of these graphs that the infant mortality rates in both Nigeria and the United Kingdom is decreasing. However, they're decreasing at different rates. The United Kingdom's infant mortality rate has decreased at an overall exponential rate. It's decreased a ton. While in Nigeria, it's decreased at a more linear rate which is very interesting. Um, we can also look at the numbers of infant mortality rates. So the infant mortality rate in present day Nigeria is about, I'd say, 100 and actually, no, it's below the 100 mark. So it's about 75, I would say. And then in the UK, the infant mortality rate is probably about like four to five. So they've decreased um, more exponentially in the UK to very, very low numbers. 
We could probably say that Nigeria's infant mortality rates is expected to decrease. Of course, the UK's will decrease um, more and more, go from four to three to two, that sort of thing. But Nigeria's is going to decrease more. And we could probably expect over time that as the country develops, remember it's less developed in the United Kingdom, they'll reach numbers like four, three, two, one later on, just a very, very far later on. Um, now, why is the UK's infant mortality rate decreasing exponentially compared to Nigeria's? Well, the UK is obviously more developed, and they started developing earlier. They had access to industrialization and better healthcare systems and sanitation uh, quicker than Nigeria did. They had better access to food and water and transportation all before Nigeria did. So their infant mortality rate decrease started before Nigeria did. The UK is also the hearth of the Industrial Revolution. That's where it started. So it had all that stuff quicker. Um, as well. So the exponential growth is to account for that those advancements early on. Now, Nigeria is slowly getting those advancements, so its infant mortality rate is going to decrease. And we don't expect it to go back up. It's just decreasing at a slower rate than it is in the United States. Kingdom. Well, it's actually, I would say, increasing, uh, decreasing now at a higher rate in the United Kingdom because if you look in the United Kingdom, it's kind of leveled out a little bit. It's not really decreasing. Of course, it's not really increasing either. But in Nigeria, it's continuing to decrease. So overall, UK's infant mortality rate has decreased, but now Nigeria's infant mortality rate is probably decreasing more than the UK just because it's kind of leveled out now. Let's look here at what's known as maternal mortality rate. This is very similar to infant mortality rate. It's per 100,000 births. It's just the number of women who die from maternal conditions and childbirth, stuff like that. Um, okay, here we go. Maternal mortality rate. It measures the ratio between deaths related to pregnancy and childbirth and number of babies born. It's not the death of mothers because mothers can die from other stuff that's not related to childbearing. So when they measure maternal mortality rates, they want to know causes of death related to being a mother, not just mothers. High maternal mortality rates are found in areas with higher infant mortality rates. These are our less developed countries. You'll sometimes see this abbreviated as LDCs because they have a lack of medical and health investment. They have lack of advancements and access and supplies as well as education and just emphasis on safe childbirth as well. And I thought I would include this cool little pie chart that shows the causes of maternal mortality in the world by percentage. So most maternal mortality is caused by pre-existing conditions. In more developed countries like the United States and in Europe, we see that we have better knowledge on these conditions to spot them quicker and treat them quicker to relieve them. Um, if there's conditions during childbirth, like a breached pregnancy, then we know how to relieve that or work with that to have a safish childbirth. In less developed countries, they may not even know how to identify these conditions and work with them. They may not know how these conditions will affect childbearing as well. The next one is severe bleeding. Uh, tearing is a very, very common part of childbirth. And of course, in more developed countries, we know how to uh, treat it better than in uh, less developed countries, like those sub-Saharan African countries or in South Asian countries. So a lot of these can be prevented and treated in more developed countries just because of the healthcare advancements and knowledge compared to our less developed countries. So this is kind of a uh, graph similarity comparison slide to show you that the maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates are both high in these same countries. We can point to regions in Southeast Asia, uh, that was a bad circle, South Asia and Sub-Saharan in Africa. You could probably say Western Africa, Central Africa, Eastern Africa, and Southern Africa as well, if you'd like to. So this is human migration. Remember, immigration is people coming into the country, immigration with an I, and then emigration with an E is people leaving a country. So this shows net immigration. If it's blue, that's when there's more people coming into the country, and when a country is red, that's when more people are leaving the country. They have higher rates of emigration here. So we can see here more developed countries um, like in Western Europe, North America, Australia, um, they see higher rates of immigration and a lot of less developed countries like in South Asia, uh, East Asia, Western Africa, Central America, they're seeing higher rates of emigration, people leaving those countries. A lot of countries in Eastern Europe have a lot of emigration as well because people want to escape unstable governments and just uh, not so good economic conditions as well. And of course, Greenland because nobody wants to live in Greenland. So yeah, pretty interesting. What about the rate of natural increase? What is the rate of natural increase? That sounds like a very environmental term. It's not. It relates to humans. So rate of natural increase is a math equation. Birth rates minus death rates. No, you will not have to calculate this 
on the AP exam. It's quote unquote the difference between the crude birth rate and the crude death rate over a particular time period. Um, it's a difference because it is subtraction. Now you're not going to be having to calculate anything on the AP exam, so don't worry about this, but you do need to know this definition here. So it does not include emigration or immigration. It's literally birth rates minus death rates. So if we have a positive natural increase rate, that means that there's more births than deaths. That's population growth. It's more common in developing countries. Developing countries are less developed countries. Negative natural increase rate shows population decline. That's when the deaths are greater than the births. So this is more common in our developed countries, countries that have already established urban cities and economic um, policies and procedures and organizations and corporations and stuff like that. So this is a map that the college were put on in FRQ about 10 years ago, um, and it's showing uh, worldwide natural increase rates. So uh, the bl black shaded countries here are negative uh, growth. So Eastern uh, Asia, not Eastern Asia, Eastern Europe and Russia, negative natural increase rate, population decline. Countries that have the highest natural increase rate are in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Western Africa, as we would expect. These are the more less developed countries. And countries that are kind of getting close to real decline um, are countries like uh, Western Europe and uh, Brazil, Australia, China, uh, United States, and Canada, the countries we would expect to be kind of moderate. And these are the countries, when we looked at the population pyramid, the population was kind of stable. It's not really increasing a lot. It's not really decreasing a lot. And these uh, black shaded countries with a negative natural increase rates, the population pyramids um, showed declining population, a lot more elderly compared to children. And then in population pyramids where uh, we see a high natural increase rate, that's where the birth rates are higher. And that's when they really kind of look like pyramids. They're seeing exponential population growth, the life expectancy is lower, that sort of thing. So identify the world region on the map with the highest rates of natural increase. So this was a FRQ prompt that they had. Now, I just discussed this entire map, so you probably already know which world region it is. But there's a lot of different answers College Board took. Um, now, let's also look at the world region or regions on the map with the lowest rates of natural increase rate. So this is just kind of thrown in because you got to practice your world regions a little bit. If you don't remember the, the specific regions from Unit 1, this is a good practice for you. So let's look here at the first one. Identify the world region on the map with the highest rates of natural increase. So this is going to be, uh, for the most part, most people said sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of people just said Africa, and that was accepted because most countries in Africa have that higher 2.1 uh, to 3.9% natural increase rate. West Africa was also accepted. Southern Africa, not South Africa, because South Africa is this country right here. Southern Africa, or you could have said Central Africa, or East Africa, because East Africa right here, yeah, negative. Central Africa right here, not negative. Uh, a lot of population growth. So um, things that weren't accepted is North Africa, so kind of this region here, and South Africa, because South Africa is a country. All right, here's another one. Identify the world regions on the map with the lowest rates of natural increase. So there's two. Um, Eastern Europe right here. Where's my map? Where's my map? There it is. Eastern Europe right here, and then the world region that College Board calls Russia is Siberia. So uh, that those are the two acceptable answers here uh, for that practice. So if you don't know your world regions that well, you can kind of look here and see uh, what they are. So uh, College Board doesn't say North America. That's like Canada, United States, Caribbean. They call all of this Latin America. They don't have a, a Central America. They have West Africa right here, North Africa over here, Central Africa, East Africa, and then Southern Africa. A lot of students make the mistake and say South Africa. South Africa is this country right here. It's not a region. Uh, the Middle East, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the, as well as these three island regions, Micronesia is at the top, Melanesia is at the middle, and Polynesia is at the bottom. So let's look at uh, some more FRQ practice. So this one is from last year, 2023. Um, it's an FRQ uh, comparing uh, RNI to TFR. So compare one difference between RNI and TFR as population change. So remember, RNI measures population growth or decline. TFR measures fertility. Now, that's not an acceptable answer. You got to get a little more in that. So, this is uh, something they said here. RNI is the annual percent growth rate of a population, not including migration, while TFR estimates the number of children that may be born to a woman. And then this, this is kind of optional. You don't have to say 15 to 45. Um, this first part would be fine. Um, so, something they just took is just give the definitions of these two terms. They're obviously not the same. So, that's obviously a difference between them. 
Uh, here's another one. RNI includes crude, rate, crude birth rates and crude death rates. TFR doesn't measure that. They measure the uh, children likely to be born to a woman. It doesn't involve any mortality measures at all. It looks at births, not mortality. Um, that's what I would have said is probably the mortality part. RNI is an annual statistic for a specific year. TFR is an estimate at a specific point in time, like a snapshot. That's one that probably a few students would have said. Something that probably wouldn't come to your mind, but it's still true, and now you know it. And then uh, an RNI of zero is zero population growth, but a TFR of 2.1 is at replacing itself and will not grow in numbers over time. A TFR of zero is, yeah, um, negative population growth. Um, an RNI of zero is zero population growth. So zero population growth at 2.1 is zero. Uh, a TFR 2.1 is zero population growth. Now let's talk about doubling time. There is some math to it, but you don't have to know it. I just threw it in there to make you cry a little bit. So doubling time is pretty simple. It's just the time it takes for a population to double in size. So if you have a higher birth rate, the doubling time is going to be lower. It's inversely proportional. So the higher the RNI, the higher the birth rate, there's going to be quick population growth. So if it's growing quickly, the doubling time is going to be lower. The lower the uh, population growth, the lower the TFR, the lower the RNI, the higher the doubling time is going to be because it's going to take longer for you to replace and double the current population. So is doubling time higher or low in countries with a high life expectancy? Okay, high life expectancy is a developed country. Birth rates, the RNI of a country that is uh, developed is going to be low, maybe even negative. So it's going to take a very long time for that population to double. So it's going to be very high. Is doubling time high or low in countries with a high infant mortality rate? High infant mortality rate shows um, lack of medical access, lack of medical education, advancements, lack of sanitation, that sort of thing. So that's going to be a less developed country. So that's going to be in a country with, typically with a higher total fertility rate, a higher RNI. So that's going to be a country with a low doubling time. Is doubling time high or low in countries with high amounts of emigration? So if there's a lot of people leaving the country, that's population that's declining. So it's going to take a lot more time time to replace that population so it's gonna be a high doubling time is population is doubling time higher low in countries with high amounts of emigration i'm making a lot of spelling mistakes boom fixed so if there's a lot of immigration a lot of people are coming into the country so you're going to be able to double that population a lot quicker so there's a low doubling time so here's another MCQ that I've put together for you. The natural increase rates for South American countries are shown in the table, which is true regarding population growth in these countries. So essentially, we have the RNIs for five different countries, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Uruguay. And we are just going to discuss population growth and compare these countries. So just right off the bat, we can see that they have Bolivia at the highest RNI and Uruguay at the lowest RNI. So Bolivia has the highest population growth and Uruguay has the lowest population growth. Brazil and Chile are very similar, so they have similar levels of population growth. So we're going to use that to our advantage in answering this question. So essentially, on these type of questions, we just have to go through each and every answer choice and see which one is a true statement. So Sometimes we may have two that are very similar in their truthfulness, but one is more true than the others. It could be other factors making one statement false. Oh, that's good water. Okay, now let's answer this question. So let's go through each of them. A, Bolivia has the highest maternal mortality rate, but the lowest infant mortality rate. Now, we could look at the table and look at Bolivia. They have the highest RNI. And countries with high RNIs, high population growth, we typically see high maternal mortality rates. However, we also see high infant mortality rates. So it's probably not going to be the lowest. It's probably going to be the highest infant mortality rate. So that's going to make A wrong. When there's high infant mortality rates, there's high maternal mortality rates. When there's low maternal mortality rates, there's low infant mortality rates. B, Uruguay's infant, infant mortality rate is decreasing at a higher rate than Colombia's. Something that college board might say is that infant mortality rate will increase. Infant mortality rate typically doesn't increase. It typically always decreases. Now, this one says it, yes, it is decreasing, but at a higher rate than Colombia. So let's look here. Colombia has an RNI of 9.8. Uruguay has an RNI of 3.6. Colombia has a higher population growth rate. They typically have a higher natural, uh, they typically have a higher infant mortality rate. Now, that means that there's more room for the infant mortality rate to decline. Countries that are less developed, we can probably conclude that Colombia is a little less developed than Uruguay. Uh, these developed countries typically see higher rates of infant mortality decrease. 
And that's because countries with higher RNIs will have more children to make up for the fact that more of them are going to die and not survive to adulthood. So that's probably not right as well. Brazil and Chile have similar RNIs, that is true, we've pointed that out, with varying total fertility rates because they have similar levels of immigration. So what this says is that Brazil and Chile have similar fertility rates, I'm sorry, similar immigration rates, but different total fertility rates, and that's why their RNIs are similar. That's not true, because RNI only includes birth and death rates, it doesn't include immigration at all. Uruguay's may, Uruguay may have a total fertility rate below the replacement rate. Um, let's look here. So Uruguay has an RNI of 3.6. That's a pretty low RNI. Um, that's not 3.6 children per mother. That's their total fertility rate. It's not the total fertility rate, but that would be total fertility rate. So does it? do they have a total fertility rate below replacement rate? That could be true. They could be getting to um, population growth that is um, declining. Not negative population growth, but declining population growth. So we'll come back to that one. Brazil has a slightly shorter doubling time than Colombia. So that means Brazil has a higher RNI than Colombia. And that is not true. Brazil has a lower RNI so their doubling time is going to be longer. So that's going to make D the correct answer. Your way may have a total fertility rate below the replacement rate. So you don't need to have a negative RNI to be in population decline. That's something that you need to remember here. All right, let's look at this FRQ. 2023 FRQ1 from set one. Explain why there are often differences in doubling times between less developed countries, LDCs, and more developed countries, MDCs. And this sounds like a pretty tricky question. You might have to write a lot, but it's not, I promise. So this is one sample answer that could have gotten you this whole point, the whole explanation right here. Doubling times may vary because LDCs have higher rates of natural increase than MDCs. And that's it. That's all you would have to say. Obviously, the doubling times are going to be um, lower in LDCs because they have higher natural increase rates. And here's another one. Doubling times they vary because MDCs have lower rates of natural increase than LDCs. And you can see here, these are very simple responses. You don't have to overthink everything on your FRQ. Sometimes the answers are just so straightforward. This one, however, is not as straightforward, but it's still something that you may have thought of, at least just scrambling around in your brain. LDCs have social or economic conditions that may result in population growth rates or high fertility rates, like or high infant mortality rates, low availability of health care, and or family planning. These are the conditions that cause high population growth or high fertility rates. And they will reduce the doubling time as compared to MDCs, which do not have these conditions that will make their doubling time longer. MDCs tend to have uh, lower birth rates. That's why they have lower natural increase rates. They have lower fertility rates than LDCs, which combined with their low death rates or even a low RNI result in a longer doubling time. LDCs typically have higher RNIs than MDCs, resulting in a shorter doubling time. LDCs typically have higher birth rates or higher fertility rates than MDCs, which combined with, their lo with low death rates or higher RNIs, result in a shorter doubling time. MDCs typically have a lower RNI, oftentimes a negative RNI, than LDCs, resulting in a longer doubling time. It's going to take longer for that population to double because the growth rate is shorter. So how exactly does TFR, IMR, MMR, and RNI change? We just learned a bunch of abbreviations. So we know all four of these measurements, and we know that these decrease as a country develops. But how? Economic, social, political, and environmental factors, ESPN. And this is something you're going to cover in this unit and other units, and you're going to love it, hate it, whatever. Let's go on. So we're going to start with our economic factors. What economic factors contribute to a high RNI, a high population growth? Well, high TFR is typically found in LDCs. High RNI, high TFR less developed countries. They're more rural, they're more poor, and they're more agriculture-based, not only in their economy, but also to live and support themselves. They have to grow food to eat. Death rates have been decreasing globally. RNI is high in countries with a high TFR. So we're not saying that death rates have been increasing in these low developed countries. Death rates are decreasing in these countries, and that's why they have high population growth, because when death rates decline and you have very high birth rates, you're going to have a lot of population growth. So in these countries, you have limited access access to affordable and effective family planning services and contraceptive like birth control, condoms, um, IUDs, and this leads to higher fertility rates because people will not be able to prevent pregnancies as much. Uh, they're not affordable, they're not accessible, and they may not even work. 
Children are seen as economic assets who can contribute to a household income and support parents in an old age. So in these less developed countries, children are seen as needed to maybe work on a farm, to maybe work uh, in the family business to raise money. Uh, maybe they need to support the parents in the old age as well. If they reach retirement, they obviously can't work, so they rely on their children to support them. If they may have more children to have more support as well, especially if they're in a more poor area. In the absence of social security systems, that's kind of where this comes in, or some type of pension systems, especially when people are working for themselves, parents may have more children to ensure that they have support in the old age. Families often have more children to provide labor for farming or other agricultural activities, and this labor can provide food on the table for them to eat or for food for them to sell, you know, family business. In regions with high infant mortality rates, these low developed countries, parents may have more children to ensure that they have children that survive to adulthood. If you have many, many children, some of them are going to die. If you have one or two ch ch children, there's a very high chance that one or both of those children are going to die, and you won't have any to survive to adulthood. Lower levels of education, particularly for women, are correlated with higher fertility rates. In less developed countries, education is not seen as a priority, and it may not be something that's um, available, provided by the government, or something that's affordable for everyone. Education in low developed countries is typically offered to men first, and then to women. Educated women are more likely to delay marriage. So in our more developed countries, we see more marriage delays, and childbirth delays, and lower uh, children per woman. Continuing on, in rural areas of South Asian countries like India and Afghanistan, there are high total fertility rates, and these are influenced by economic reliance on children for labor and support, as well as traditional gender roles. So let's look at some data here, lots of data. So we have the child mortality rate in Afghanistan, and we can see here that the mortality rate has been decreasing exponentially in recent years. We have healthcare spending up here. We show significant healthcare spending increases over the past uh, few years. Total fertility rate in Afghanistan. Total fertility rate has declined significantly from about 7.6 to about 4.5. And we have a population pyramid as well showing uh, exponential population growth in Afghanistan as well. All right, so let's look at this. Child mortality rate has been decreasing. We can probably uh, connect that to our healthcare over here. Um, look at that. As healthcare has gone up, child mortality rate has decreased. And as the mortality rate decreases here, we're going to see birth rates increase. You can see that the birth rates have decreased over time, but they decreased later. So child mortality rate decreased earlier than the total fertility rate. So that's why we have significant birth rates here. And with healthcare spending increasing, there's more resources, more availability to healthcare that can limit the number of infants dying and children dying. So that's why we see the mortality rate decrease and the population increase as well. And we see a lot of children being born because they're seen as uh, forms of labor and family support and it's something that women should do. It's value to have high amounts of children in this region. Now, what economic factors influence a low infant mortality rate and a low maternal mortality rate? What causes these to decrease? Well, healthcare is a big one. If you have mothers and infants have access to healthcare and doctors and facilities and resources, we're going to see that the rates of death for both mothers and infants are going to decrease. Post-industrial economies in more developed countries allow increased care for infants. We see greater parental leave, greater paternity and maternity leave programs, so parents can spend time and raise children. Remote work's been a great example of um, a way for families to continue to prosper and parents to spend time with children as well. Access to child care providers like daycare, preschool, babysitters, um, and they also have to be able to afford them as well. Developed economies allow for more investment into healthcare. When you have people with higher incomes or earning higher than they did before, they can afford more go uh, goods and services, especially healthcare services and um, other goods that impact their well-being. Strong social welfare programs mean that parents can get more information or training about taking care of a new baby. Strong social welfare programs mean that infants may receive sufficient food as well, like Gerber ghost peppers, ba baby's first heart attack. 
We also see a higher standard of living correlated with lower rates. They provide greater access to con consistent and sufficient healthy foods. They provide for better sanitation and hygiene. We see increased access to education for both men and women, but especially women, and this reduces um, adolescent fertility, so women are having kids later or not at all. All. So if you have kids not at all, obviously the maternal mortality rate is going to decrease because they're not mothers. Less people are going, or they're having one kid, they might have that one kid and may live. So that's going to uh, impact the maternal mortality rate. We also have more knowledge on child care and nutrition. Women will have fewer children may lead to better infant and child health. They could take care of one child better than maybe seven kids. Look at this parent in the top right corner doing her remote work. She can take care of that one kid and still do her job. If she had four kids, it would be a lot more challenging. What economic factors impact a low natural increase rate, population decline, or just slow population growth? Women will enter the labor force outside of the home. They'll become independent, or they may enter the manufacturing sector. They typically don't enter the agriculture sector. That typically stays as a male-dominated industry in the commercial sense. Women may pro choose to prioritize their careers instead of having children, or they may delay having children. And women have a biological clock, so if they delay it, they'll probably have fewer children. Families no longer need large families for farm labor farming becomes more business oriented so big corporations are going to replace family farms gender equity will increase as families move to cities and women gain access to better health care cost of living increases in these cities you need more money for food for rent there's less space so it becomes more expensive to raise children space will decrease while cost increases contraceptive and family planning services are more readily available and they're more effective cities are allowed they're crowded so diseases spread more quickly and they're full of crime. They're not the ideal conditions for one to want to raise children. Urbanization, which is just the migration from rural to urban areas, leads to a declining total fertility rate, which leads to a declining natural increase rate. And that's kind of the trend that we see here. So this is a map of the cost of living in the United States. And the cost of living is, of course, higher in those urban areas, in areas like Los Angeles. I'm looking at the, the cities in Texas, like Dallas and Houston. I'm looking up at Boston and New York. York and those major cities, Chicago, those all have the higher cost of living. You look at Seattle in the, in the state of Washington, that has a very high cost of living as well. In these uh, areas, we can expect total fertility rates to decrease because of how expensive it is to just not only support yourself, but to have kids and have multiple kids as well. Greece very recently put in a six-day work week, um, which is very interesting, and I'm sure it will have effects on their fertility rates. So this is what the article said. The change means a traditional 40-hour work week is extended to a 48-hour per week for some businesses. The only ones that are excluded are food, service, and tourism, which is a major part of the economy, but not the whole economy. So they're most for the rest of the economy, they're going to be working six days a week, eight hours a day. They're not going to have time to raise kids. They may see work a greater priority and maybe they'll, maybe they'll leave work and they may not have incomes and they won't be able to support having kids they may move out of greece we don't expect that this will have any positive effects on uh, the fertility rates in greece which is already declining this uh, graph on the right shows the population in Greece, and we can see that it's in a decline, and this is probably not going to help it as well because people are going to have to spend more time and energy on work instead of kids. They try to boost productivity and employment. Um, something that they had in mind is that they boost productivity and boost employment, and the economy does well. People are going to have higher incomes and be able to support kids. But not only do you need money for kids, but you also need time and energy. So let's look at an FRQ that I did on my AP exam a few years ago from 2021. Explain how access to education for women and less developed countries is likely to affect the total fertility rate. So right off the bat, what does education for women do to total fertility rates? It decreases it. So we have to say that it decreases it, and then we have to say why. So the TFR is likely to decrease with increased access to education because additional economic and career opportunities will spring up, and they may not they may choose not to have children. Um, we see the TFR to decrease because of increased age of the first pregnancy, or increased marriage age, decreased teen pregnancy, increased access to information on reproduction and family planning options, increased gender equity. Those, All these factors here are going to lead to a TFR decrease with increased access to education in our less developed countries.
What about social factors? What social factors impact a high population growth? In regions with high infant mortality rates, parents may have more children to ensure that some survive to adulthood. The absence of social safety nets and pension systems, pension systems, particularly those allocated by the government, will come about in developed countries that have the resources and the tax basis to fund these uh, pensions, especially in countries with a high elderly population after the life expectancy increases. But when there's an absence of pensions and social security systems, families will have more children as a form of old age security, and they're going to have more of them to ensure that they survive to adulthood and are able to take care of them. In some cultures, having many children is seen as a sign of prosperity, strength, and social status. Certain religions include, encourage large families. It may discourage the use of contraception. This picture in the bottom right is of a Mormon family. It's a very large family. In some societies, there's a strong preference for male children. We saw this happen in China in recent years, which can result in families continuing to have children until a desired number of sons is achieved. Or in China, it will just lead to the death of female babies. In many cultures, girls are married at a younger age age. In developed countries, typically they delay marriage. And when you get married at a younger age, you have more time to have kids. So you're probably going to see more frequent and more um, higher childbearing rates. So here's a practice multiple choice question on social factors I put together for you. Um, try to answer it and we'll go over each of the answer choices. So which of the following best identifies a social factor for the demographic trends shown on the graph? So before we look at the answer choices, let's look at what these demographic trends are. So we have the total fertility rate in the United States for a 200 120 year period and overall the total fertility rate has decreased it has fluctuated at some points after world war ii we saw the baby boom but then it decreased again and it's continuing to overall decrease so that's a trend that we are seeing here so what's caused or what's been correlated with this total fertility rate decrease? Is it religious conversions or declining practice? I don't think so because most over 50 percent of america is religious so it wouldn't be declining religious practice. It would be maybe changing religious practice, possibly. Maybe not conversions. Um, Christianity has always been the most dominant religion in the United States. So maybe um, changing um, practices with religion, but not religious conversions or just no religious affiliation whatsoever. Cultural attitudes towards smaller families. That could be one. Having a smaller family in the United States is the norm for the most part. State support for middle-aged and elderly mothers. Um, kind of, you just think about it. Kind of common sense. Women have a biological clock, so the number of middle-aged and elderly mothers there are is not that high. Um, so, state support for middle-aged and elderly mothers, mo mothers, mothers isn't going to have really any impact on the total fertility rate. Total fertility rate would decrease if you see decreased state support for young mothers. Um, but if you have any kind of support from mothers in general, that's typically going to increase the total fertility rate because that's going to incentivize having children. Um, but this answer choice, it's just not that big of an impact at all. It's kind of, it's negligible. D, a shift to a service-based economy. This is, says economy. This is not a social factor. So college board will often do that. They'll give something that is technically right like this, but it's not the answer to the question. So this is asking for a social factor. This is an economic factor. So that's not going to be the right answer here. Um, even though that is true, a shift to a more service-based economy that typically opens up women to more job opportunities and education, and that, yeah, will lead to a decreased total fertility rate. But that's not a social factor, so it's not right. And then E, high infant mortality rates result in less surviving children. Developed countries see low infant mortality rates. They decrease over time. They don't typically increase, but they uh, decrease Increase over time. And when you have a very developed country like the United States, you see very, very low infant mortality rates and more surviving children. So that's going to make B the correct answer here. Now, what political factors create an area with high population growth, a high rate of natural increase? Governments may implement policies that provide financial incentives, such as child allowances and tax breaks and subsidies for families with multiple children. Tax breaks for families that have um, four or more children, three or more children, those have been seen to impact fertility rates.
In Singapore, they've put in a baby bonus scheme, which includes actual cash, liquid cash, gifts, and savings for children. And this is aimed to encourage higher birth rates to kind of uh, give a financial foundation for children and families with children. They may have generous maternity or paternity leave policies that encourage families to have more children. In Sweden, parents are entitled to very generous paternity leave. They can have up to 480 days between the two parents at 80% of their salary. So they're getting most of their salary and they get over a year of uh, combined paternity leave. And that can encourage families to have children or to discourage families from not having children because that can be seen as a incentive like, okay, we can still keep our jobs and we can still financially support ourselves. The provisioning of affordable or free childcare services makes it easier for parents to have more children while balancing work and family life. Parents don't have to worry about who's taking care of their kids. France offers very heavily government subsidized childcare services through a system called crèches. I think that's how you say it. I don't know. I don't speak French. Where parents pay according to their income, making it more feasible for parents to have multiple children, especially lower income parents. You pay it in a proportion. It's not a one price fits all system. What about, uh, let's look at some more political factors. We're continuing this. Government investment in healthcare, including maternal and child healthcare, may reduce infant mortality rates and increase life expectancy. And this contributes to overall population growth. It contributes to higher birth rates and lower death rates. Effective public health campaigns and initiatives, such as vaccination programs and disease prevention efforts, can improve overall health and reduce mortality rates. And that will lead to population growth. Australia put in an HPV vaccination program for girls across the entire country about um, 15 ish 16 17 years ago and they extended it to boys as well just about 10 years ago and this program aims to reduce hpv and hpv related cancers and other diseases through vaccinations and that can improve the um not the birth rates but decrease the death rates Political stability and just living in a country where the government is not unstable, the government is not corrupt, there's national security. This can encourage population growth because it's a safe environment for raising children. Would you rather raise a child in Ukraine, Russia, or would you rather raise a child in the United States or Canada where they're not actively at war? Immigration policies do have an impact on population change. So remember, immigration doesn't contribute to the natural increase rate. The natural increase rate is birth rates minus death rates. So let's look at immigration policies, for example. So this population pyramid is of the UAE and the United Arab Emirates, and the population in the UAE is 88 to 90% immigrants. Um, nationals are about 10 to 12%. So nationals are actually minorities in the UAE. And we can see here there's a lot of guest workers. And guest workers, for the most part, are particularly male. So that's why we see this dominating male um, cohort in the population pyramid for about ages 20 to actually like 65. It's very prominent. The UAE's labor market policies include a visa sponsorship system that allows allows employers to sponsor foreign workers. So it's very easy for companies and corporations in the UAE to get foreign workers and to afford it as well. The introduction of long-term residence visas, these are called golden visas, for investors, entrepreneurs, specialized talents, and researchers aims to attract skilled professionals and investors. Now let's look at Japan. 2.8% of Japan's population is foreign residents. 90 7.2% of the population in Japan is Japanese, for the most part. Japan has historically had very strict policies regarding um, immigration and refugee resettlement. For one, they're isolated, so it's not too easy to get to the country. It's easier now, but even then, it's not a walk in the park. They accept very few asylum seekers relative to their population size. They have very strict immigration policies and regulation. They prioritize very, very skilled migration, and they want the best of the best for more temporary settlement. The UAE, they're fine with temporary and permanent settlement, but in Japan, they particularly only like temporary settlement. What environmental factors impact a high population growth? Well, regions with variable, uh, not variable, favorable climates for agriculture and productive agriculture will see higher birth rates due to the ability to sustain larger populations as well as abundant food resources. The first cities developed thousands of years ago because they had an agriculture surplus. They could feed the current population and then so the population that will inevitably grow. Regions with plentiful water resources like on the coast often see higher birth 
birth rates and lower mortality rates. You can grow crops as well. The availability of minerals and energy, natural resources can boost local economies, improve living standards, and support higher population growth. Regions with low prevalence of diseases, particularly infections, both viruses and bacterial infections, tend to have higher birth rates and lower death rates. Countries typically have very, very high death rates until they see antibiotics and sanitation start to take effect. Once that happens, they'll see the first decline of the death rates. Areas less prone to natural disasters are going to have higher NIRs. That's typically just what we see here. We're going to look at an example of that shortly. So in 2004, there was an earthquake in the Indian Ocean, and it led to a tsunami. So on Boxing Day in 2004, the day after Christmas, there was a powerful earthquake off the coast of Sumatra, which is a small Indonesian island in the Indian Ocean. It was a magnitude 9.1 earthquake. It's the third largest in the world since 1900. It's very rare, very powerful, and it created a tsunami that reached heights of 167 feet and caused flooding up to three miles, which is five kilometers inland. So it caused heavy amounts of damage. Uh, the tsunami itself, the tsunami, not the earthquake, was responsible for most of the damage and the deaths. It affected 17 countries in Southern Asia, Southeastern Asia, Eastern and Southern Africa. So it had a big geographic widespread impact and it led to 230,000 deaths and the displacement of 1.7 million people. Let's look at an FRQ um, from 2021 again. Explain the degree to which access to specialized women's health care in more developed countries is likely to affect a country's total fertility rate. Um, so we're going to answer this like on an FRQ on the AP exam. So explain the degree. You're going to have one to two of these explain the degree prompts on your AP exam. And what you got to do is you have to say how true a statement is. Is it true to a high degree or is it true to a low degree? So once you say that, you have to back it up. These are pretty much the only argumentative prompts on your FRQs. So you have to back up your choice and argue it, essentially. Um, so you have to say in this FRQ, either a moderate to high degree. I would never say moderate. I would stick to saying either high degree of relevancy or low degree of relevancy. And then you got to say why. So it is true. It, it is um, high degree. Uh, it will affect the total fertility rate to a high degree because the TFR is likely to decrease because women are having access to information on personal reproductive health. It's going to decrease because women have increased access to birth control, increased access to surgical sterilization like hysterectomies. Women have the ability to terminate pregnancies for personal or medical reasons. Typically, this is higher in more developed countries. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. It really does help me out and it costs zero dollars. I have some free resources for you in the description down below if you'd like to use them. If you have any AP Human Geography related questions whatsoever, don't hesitate to leave a comment down below the video or send me a message on Discord. I'll see you guys in the next video though. Adios.